We have a lot of things going on in the church right now. <clears throat> Do you guys see how many kids were here? Praise God. Because <clears throat> that's what it's about. That generation. So we've got a lot of things going on in the church. Like I can't talk. And uh, people are going through a lot of things, including myself, health-wise and other things. And... Uh, <clears throat> I thought this morning, I'm not going to say I'm going to slow it down any, but I'm going to go over some things, hopefully give everybody hope, inspiration, and let them know the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, Jesus Christ, is not out of the miracle performing business, and he never has been. And I'm going to go through some of these with you guys, and hopefully that it will give you some encouragement and some hope knowing that this I know for a fact. Your faith can do wonders. Your faith can do wonders. Miracle number one was changing water into wine. John 2, 1, 11. Near the beginning of this public ministry, about 2,000 years ago, Jesus attended a wedding in Cana with his mother Mary, and with his newly selected disciples. Mary informs him that the wedding hosts have run out of wine, which would be cause of great embarrassment for her and her family. At the urging of his mother, Jesus miraculously transformed water into wine. This might be the least of the 40 miracles that Jesus would perform throughout his public ministry, more than 40, which it's often estimated to have lasted three and a half years. But it spared the wedding host the embarrassment. It gave his disciples a gentle introduction into what Jesus was capable of doing miracle-wise. And it undoubtedly made Jesus' mother happy. <clears throat> the Bible tells us also that there's only a, a little over 40 miracles in the Bible that are written that Jesus did. But there's one passage in John that lets you know just how powerful the Son of God, Jesus Christ, is. It said that if they wrote every miracle down, it would cover the world multiple times. That's how many he performed in, in just that brief amount of time. Could you imagine if he would have had more time? <clears throat> in John 2, 13 through 25, I won't read it, but I'll let you if you want to. It says, after John writes about the water to rhyme miracle in Cana, he explains that Jesus visits the Jerusalem for Passover, clears the temple grounds of vendors and money changers, and performs miraculous signs. John does not describe the miracles, but does say that many people came to believe in him. Jesus receives a nighttime visit from Nicodemus, a prominent Pharisee, who refers to the signs and seeks teaching. Jesus responds, that's where John 3.16 comes into play. One, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever should believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. It's also where Jesus looks Nicodemus in the eye and says that unless one be born again, they cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. They're talking about born again of the Spirit, meaning that you need to accept Jesus, you need to repent of your sin, and be baptized in water. So that was... Not only a miracle with that, <clears throat> but it's a double dose of miracles. The double dose is, could you imagine a high priest coming into Jesus' camp and asking Jesus, what do I need to do? And theologically, it stated <clears throat> that both Josephus and Nicodemus were actually followers from that point of Jesus of Nazareth. So that in itself is one of the greatest miracles. Amen? <clears throat> in John 4, 46, 54, <clears throat> and a royal official, <clears throat> a royal official from Capernaum travels to the town of Cana in the hopes of finding Jesus and securing a miracle for a son who is deathly ill with fever. He finds Jesus and begs him to come to Capernaum. Capernaum, I'm sorry. Jesus declines the invitation and notes that even during the early phase of the public ministry, people already are, already are seeking him for miracles and teachings. 
The man persists, perhaps showing his faith that Jesus can heal, and Jesus tells the man that his son will live. The royal official believes Jesus, begins his journey back home, and learns that his son has indeed been healed. Now again, this miracle has one more implication other than the, the centurion's son was healed. His faith from far away was healed. Jesus did not have to physically go to his house to heal him. He said, your faith has let this happen. So your faith today, if you have anything going on at all, anything, any cancer, any heart problem, any mental problem, any sadness, any hatred, any anger, if you have anything going on in your heart today, your faith can heal it. Billy Wilkerson, or Billy, Billy Graham, me, Pastor Carter, David Wilkerson, Benny Hinn, Joyce Meyer, Creflo Dollar, anybody, Prince, anybody that you turn on TV today is not going to heal you. But your faith is going to heal you. You have to have so much confidence in God, in Jesus, that you know that whatever is going on in your body right now, it's only a prayer away. It's only a prayer away. Redemption from the cross is a prayer away. You can get rid of it. All of it. All strife. All hatred. All bitterness. All cancer. All heart problems. Everything. Gone right now, this minute. If your faith is strong enough for it. You know how I know that? The Bible tells us that. Your faith. That's when you clap. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. <coughs> I got a... <coughs> Catching a large number of fish. Luke 5, 1 to 11. Again, I'm not going to read them all. Just please just follow through. You know, go back to the other one, though. <clears throat> We're going to go back to... <clears throat> performing the signs in Jerusalem, the second one that I said. People said, or say, that Jesus' actions when he first went into Jerusalem was one of, one of a scorned son. When he complained about the money changers, he complained about them bringing animals in for sale or changing money into different denominations in different countries and so forth. That was Jesus again proving a point. With God, everything is everything. With man, it's not. We've got to put faith in God. We've got to put faith in Jesus. We've got to let that cross mean everything in our lives, and we've got to turn back to it. We saw this morning all of those children in here. Man, if everybody's heart didn't swell this big, seeing all of those kids in this church, because that's what we've got to concentrate on. We need to worry about us too. We're not dead yet. Check the guy sitting to you. Make sure they're still breathing. Okay, we're all alive in here right now. So we've got work to do too. But we need to really concentrate on the children. And that, that's just such a blessing, man. Back to catching a large number of fish. Early during his public ministry, Jesus promotes some of the disciples to be evangelists. To that end, he performs a miracle involving the catch of a number, large number of fish. Some of his disciples were fishermen who plied their trade to the Sea of Galilee. After a night of catching nothing, Jesus instructs Peter to cast a net into the sea. Peter obeys, and the yield of fish overwhelms him to the point that drops to his knees in amazement. Jesus uses the miracle to call Peter and, <clears throat> and others to the evangelists. And, as in fishers of people, Jesus performs a similar miracle. Shortly before his ascension into heaven, he reminds Peter and others to serve the Christian church and preach the gospel. <clears throat> this is where Jesus tells them, 
I will make, and you've seen this on stories, but it's, you know, you guys watch The Chosen and you watch Son of God and you watch the Bible stories and anything that can give you faith, anything that can give you hope in Jesus Christ is a good thing to watch. But they're not always in chronological order. They put them however the movie needs to put them to, to make the audience think more favorably of what they're doing. <clears throat> Jesus, prior to the catching of all the fish, said, I will make you fishers of men. And then he goes out and catches fish. And then as he ascends into heaven, he tells them, go out and preach into the churches. People said, is it important to attend a church and be in the body of the church? Because the Bible doesn't specifically say, if you don't go to church, you can't go to heaven. And it doesn't say that. But what it does say is to fellowship with like-minded. And on Jesus' ascension, he says, serve the Christian church and preach the gospel. We should all be inside of a church on Sunday morning. We should all be inside of the River Terrace Cowboy Church on Sunday morning. Yeah. Yeah. We should all be listening to good music. A cappella or a guitar or the beatbox or you should have seen John this morning. He came in with short sleeves cut out and a pair of cut off shorts with a boom box. Came. Oh, that was a different morning. <laughs> Get the visual out of your head. It didn't happen. How's Nora? Good. We'll be praying. <clears throat> so we should be inside of a church. We should be enjoying each other's fellowship. We should be enjoying everybody's company uh, because we're in here with like-minded people. That's what Jesus wanted. That's how you spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's how you spread the gospel of the cross, and that's how you spread the gospel of God. <clears throat> and we do that. I said last week, if everybody that we reach out there on, on, on all of this stuff, if we only reached one, it was worth it. And I'm going to tell you a story. I told this story to Austin about seven or eight months ago, the girl in Maine. Her daughter, <clears throat> her mother watches us on iTube 247. The daughter was getting bullied at school. The mother was watching the show. The daughter was in the, the kitchen. She had been contemplating suicide all night. She comes into the kitchen, and her own words was, she wanted to just be near her mother because she was going to end her life that day. She watched us, all of us, the music, the preaching, all of this. And she sat and watched it twice. Her mother emailed and said that sometime this summer, her and her daughter would like to come and pay us a visit. They're in Bath, Maine. Because her daughter, because of what we do in here, is still a 17-year-old senior going to be in high school that is starting to enjoy life. So if you don't think this small church makes a difference, we do. So to Rebecca and Grace, you're more than welcome. We look forward to you this summer. Everybody say hi, Rebecca. <laughs> so healing of the possessed man in Capernaum, that's in two of the Gospels. Mark and Luke. And as Jesus was teaching in a synagogue in Capernaum, a demon-possessed man began shouting at Jesus, Have you come to destroy us? I know you are the Holy One of God. Here is a demon. You know, the Bible tells us that Satan believes and trembles. This demon inside of this boy proclaims, I know you are the Holy One sent by God. Jesus commands the demon to leave. The man is healed, and the news of the miracle travels quickly throughout the region of Galilee in northern Israel. Hours later, people from the Galilean town of Capernaum would swarm Jesus with requests for miracles. Chronologically, this appears to be the first exorcism that Jesus performs. Some scholars suggest that demon possession sharply increased during the time of Jesus' ministry because of Satan. <clears throat> Go to Matthew, Mark, and Luke. 
for the healing of Peter's mother-in-law. After Jesus healed the possessed man in the synagogue, he and his disciples went to the home in Capernaum where Peter and Andrew were residing. They learned that Peter's mother-in-law was sick in bed with a high fever. Jesus takes her by the hand, helps her up, and she is instantly healed. This home might have belonged to her as Peter and Andrew were from Bethsaida. I can't say it with my teeth. John 144, read that. Jesus based much of his public ministry in Capernaum because staying at this house. Again, Jesus goes and he heals someone based on their faith in him. Their faith in him. You want things in your life today to be better? Base it on Jesus, not man. I don't know a single man that can do anything Jesus did. None. But I know a Jesus that still can. I know a Jesus that still heals. I know a Jesus that still cares. So that ought to be the slogan. You know, instead of WWJD, what would Jesus do? I would put, I know Jesus can. I-K-J-C. I know Jesus can, because he can, and he has, and he will until the end of time. <clears throat> We're going to go again to Matthew, Mark, and Luke. At sunset during the same day that Jesus healed the demon-possessed man, I already did that one, healing a leper in Galilee. We're going to go to Matthew and Mark. After a series of miracles in Capernaum, Jesus begins his first missionary tour through the towns of Galilee, preaching about the kingdom of God. In one of those towns, a, a diseased man, covered with leprosy, <clears throat> falls to the feet of Jesus and begs for a miracle. The man addresses Jesus as Lord and expresses his faith that Jesus can heal him. Jesus, moved by compassion, reaches out and touches a man. The man is healed instantly. Another key passage. He calls Jesus Lord. And he believes with all of his heart because of his faith in Jesus. His faith that he can and will be healed. And guess what his faith did? Through Jesus, He's healed. If you've got something wrong with you, your faith, it wouldn't be the first time it's ever happened. It'd be the hundred millionth time it's happened. This isn't just a, a hearsay. Somebody up here just spewing to spew. It's recorded in history. There's doctors, to, there's doctors today that can't explain how the cancer left. Or how that child that wasn't ever going to live did. Or how this disease was there and then it's not. These people, these doctors that get the best medical training they can get cannot explain how it happened. But I'm going to tell you how it happened. Our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, is still working. He's still at work in all of us. And he will change your life. He will change your life. He will give you dominion over every illness, disease, <clears throat> or anything going on in your life. You just have to believe in him. Don't believe in man. They'll, they'll mess you up every time. Believe in God. Believe in Jesus Christ. That's how the boat rolls. <clears throat> Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all three, three of the four Gospels. When Jesus is teaching at a house in Capernaum, a group of men bringing a paralyzed man in the hopes of getting him healed by Jesus. The problem, though, is that Jesus is inside the house, and the house is overflowing with people. So the men climb into the roof, move whatever thatch and boards are in the way, lower the paralyzed man 
So there he is in the presence of Jesus. Their faith, persistence, and creativity paid off. Jesus heals the man instantly, and he is miraculously able to walk. Now here's a, a, a different instance. <clears throat> because of what they did that showed Jesus how strong their faith was, healed. By them putting the paralyzed man on the roof, moving the roof, the, the, the wood, <clears throat> And, and the, the limbs and everything was up there. Moving them, getting ropes, lowering him, people catching him at the bottom, showed enough initiative for Jesus that their faith was solid. If they're willing to go through all of this, they know he can do it. And so because of their persistency and their faith, Jesus immediately heals him. Amen? <clears throat> Healing a man, this is in John, healing a man who had been disabled for 38 years at the pool of Bethesda. During a time when Jesus is in Jerusalem, he goes to the pool of Bethesda, which believed by many to have healing powers. There, a man who had been disabled for 38 years is trying to get into the water, but the other people keep cut, cutting, off, cutting him off in front of him whenever a spot becomes available in the pool. Jesus asked the man if he wants to be healed. He then instructs the man to get up and walk, and suddenly he is miraculous, miraculously unable to do so. The man did not know who Jesus was and learns of his name later when the two men meet again at the temple. This is an example how you, Jesus used somebody who had no faith because he didn't know him. He didn't know who Jesus was. But Jesus knew he needed him in a little while. So he healed him so that he could go before the Sanhedrin and tell them who healed him. Even though he was told not to, Jesus knew he was going to anyways. That is another example of the power of Jesus Christ. His power, not man's. I'm going to skip one and go to healing people with the crowd that followed him into Galilee. After Jesus, that's Matthew and Mark. After Jesus heals the man with the withered hand, he withdraws to the Sea of Galilee, where it is revealed that Pharisees are plotting to have him killed. During his retreat, Jesus continues his public ministry without interpretation, healing people of disease and demon possession within a crowd that followed him. Here's another instance where they don't exactly describe how many people Jesus healed. That's why in John it says it would cover the world many times. It was a large crowd, and he just went through going, healed, 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 healed. He, he'd do the little Larry Bird, <sighs> healed. He just went through and healed everybody. You know why? Because he was that gracious to that crowd. Because that crowd was following him because they believed in him. If you... Believe in Jesus. Anything and everything is possible. Anything and everything is possible. Amen? Now here's another example in Matthew and Luke. I'll finish this up in a minute. I know the band said they had three songs today instead of two. So in Matthew and Luke, <clears throat> during a time when Jesus is back in Capernaum, a centurion asked him to heal a servant who was deathly ill. The centurion, who had been com ha has command over a hundred soldiers, <clears throat> feels unworthy to approach Jesus himself, so he sends messengers. And he feels unworthy to have Jesus come to his home where the servant is. Jesus praises the remarkable humility and faith of the centurion, heals the servant from a distance, and prophesies that many Gentiles, like this centurion, will enter the kingdom of God. This is important. In Matthew's summary, he appears to rely on the ancient tradition of equating messengers with the person who sent them. Luke, however, focuses on the humility of the centurion and notes the involvement of messengers. <clears throat> Pastors and evangelists 
on Sunday morning are up here as messengers to God, from God. That's what all of them across the country, that's what they're meant to do. These messages that we send you, whether it's through the music ministry, whether it's through associate pastors, head pastors, everybody, these messages are sent to you just like this centurion came and said, hey, I need you. We're just trying to teach you how important it is that Jesus Christ is the guy. He's that guy. This isn't that guy. He's that guy. He died on that to be that guy. This centurion knew through humility, I'm not worthy to even go meet Jesus, but I know what he can do. I'm going to go send a couple of people and just say, hey, you know, I know that you're the, the first Michael Jordan and all this. Do you think you could just do this old boy this favor? Without hesitation. The first thing Jesus thought was, man, this guy believes in me so much, and he has so much humility thinking that I shouldn't be in his home. But I should be in everyone's home. But I get it. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this. I'm going to tell the messengers, healed. So that he knows the power from a distance. He knows what's in this hand because this is thunder. This hand is lightning. And I can reach you from anywhere. And I heal him because of his faith, and because of his humility, he will be healed. When he guess what happened? He was healed. He was healed. I'm going to skip a few and try to get in one more. I've said this one a million times, so I'm going to skip it to the lady that bled all those years. I'm going to go right into Jairus' daughter. Um, it's in three of the four Gospels as well, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And just before Jesus heals the woman with internal, internal bleeding, a community leader named Jairus drops to his knees and begs Jesus to come to his home and heal his 12-year-old daughter who is dying. On their way to the house, the woman with internal bleeding is healed. Before they arrive at the house, Jesus and Jairus learn Jesus' daughter had died, or Jairus' daughter had died. Jesus enters the home, instructs the mourners to leave, and restores life to the young girl, showing again that his power over death itself is immense. There's criteria with everything in the Bible. There's the do's and the don'ts and the he's and the we's and everything else. I couldn't get through half of these this morning because by the time we'd have went to the Carters to eat after church, all the food would be cold. That's how many there are. That's how many healings there are in just the New Testament. Not even the Old Testament that says he's going to heal. Uh, I know, coincidence, right? It's all a coincidence. It's God. And it's Jesus. Nobody, and all these 40-plus miracles, nobody was ever healed that had a hard heart. Nobody was ever healed that has a, 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 a heavy tongue. Nobody was ever healed that didn't believe other than one. And that's only because he didn't know. Everyone that knew Jesus that believed in Jesus, that followed the commandments, that followed him. I want you to understand this, please. One day, your sons or daughters or nephews or nieces or husbands or spouses or grandparents or whoever, neighbor that you love, one day, they're going to need Jesus. And one day, <clears throat> they may need you to be that messenger to Christ because they don't know him yet. Be in the position to be that messenger. Do you understand what I'm saying? Be in that position to be the messenger. Because if your heart is hard and if you don't believe and your daughter or your son 
or your grandparent or your mother and your father needs assistance and Jesus is the only answer, you better go find another messenger until you can get right with your faith. So this church, people out there listening on AIM Country, AIM Christian, and I-2247, everyone out there listening today, get right with God in your heart. Every church out there today, get right with God in your heart. Because every member of your congregation, sooner or later, in the body of Christ, somebody in this congregation is going to need to be touched by God. Somebody in this congregation is going to be need to be touched by Jesus. Let's make sure that we're in the position as a church in the body of Christ, that we're able to touch those people and be like the centurion that sent the messenger that God and Jesus answered with a miraculous miracle. Because there's miracles happening every day. Don't be surprised if one happens to you. Expect it. Because if you expect it, you have faith. If you're surprised by it, you lack faith. So expect the unexpected. Believe in the impossible. Dream the big dream. And pray big because we have a big... And pray big. I rewounded it. Nobody heard this. Pray big because we have a big... And if God was in the church right now, he would say... Thank you, guys.